Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening, and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us uh, in this week when we've been reminded once again that it snows in Minnesota, in case you had any doubts about that. But this too shall pass, and we will welcome spring in the weeks ahead. But as we're waiting for spring, we'll have an opportunity tonight and each Thursday that follows to talk about the public policy issues that are of concern to residents of Minnesota. And we do this through questions from you, the viewers, to our distinguished panel of guests. We invite you to call in with your questions. We invite you to send your questions via email, Twitter, um, hand signals, flags, whatever method you might think is most appropriate uh, to get questions to our panel. And we'll see that they get there and so that you can get the questions from or get answers to questions from your legislators and hence the catchy name for this program. We begin this week's program, as we do each week, by introducing our distinguished panel of guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. Uh, this week, we're, we're going to carry the load with two legislators. Our usual Senate representatives are debating health care exchanges, could not join us. But we have two distinguished guests who will do more than, uh, be more than adequate to, uh, to see that we deal with uh, the public policy questions of the day. Joining us tonight, uh, as she has on many occasions over the years, Representative Phyllis Kahn from Minneapolis. Representative Kahn, delighted to have us have you join us again. Pleased to be here, Judge. Tell and, our viewers uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, I'm one of the two most senior members of the legislature, having been elected in 1972. You can do the arithmetic. And, That's a year uh, or two ago. <laughs> right. And uh, um, delighted, of course, to be serving for the first time in just about 20 years with a Democratic House and a Democratic Senator and a Democratic Governor. And my district is right around the University of Minnesota. And so I have, I, but I also have the largest Somali population concentration probably in the country in my district. So I always say it's kind of three S's, students, Somalis, and seniors but it's a very interesting district to represent. I know we've covered this ground before, but I think it's interesting and our viewers should know you have a background in science. Tell our viewers a little bit about that. Yes, I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in physics and a PhD in biophysics, and then I went and got a master's in public policy. And uh, uh, so I came working on bacterial genetics research I do have still on the bulletin board in my office the picture, the electron microscope of a virus and the electron microscope of the DNA from that virus. And the interesting thing is I took them myself. Well, there you go. It's uh, not everyone can make that statement, I suspect, not, whether in the legislature or outside the legislature. We're delighted you're with us. Joining us for the first time uh, from District 13B, Sartell, Representative Tim O'Driscoll. Tim, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You are right on, Judge. Well, you know, Find, we get it right once in a while. <laughs> Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm happy to be able to be here with yourself and, and Representative Khan tonight. And uh, before I do that, Representative Khan and I were kind of kidding a little bit before the show started that there's two empty chairs, and we thought that I might ask the DFL chair some questions, and she may <laughs> she ask, ask the, the GOP, Republican senator chair yes, a, a few questions. But I think she'd answer for him too, so we probably don't <laughs> want to do that. Uh, yes. Um, this is my second term in the Minnesota State House, and um, come from Central Minnesota. City of Sartell, where I was the, uh, the mayor and on the city council prior to coming to the Minnesota House. Um, my District 13B uh, is the Sartell, Sock Rapid, St. Stephen, uh, Holding Ford area, and it goes all the way out to just about the city of Avon and all the townships that are in between there. The best way to describe my district, as Phyllis Khan has, has uh, described her district, would be that we are a bit of city mouse and country mouse. Um, we 
hail from the Stearns County area and the Benton County area, which is a very large egg uh, area. Most dairy cattle in um, the state of Minnesota come from that the, the four county area there, and about to three quarters of the population in my district lie in the cities of Sartell and Sac Rapids, which are very urbanized areas right near St. Cloud. So kind of the city and country mouse all at the same time. What about your personal background? What do you what do you do when you're not in the legislature? Uh, educational background, things of that sort. My uh, training is a graduate from St. Cloud State University, and I uh, have three different degrees from there, or I should say three different majors <laughs> from there. One is, uh, one is in uh, education, business education, teaching school, another is in office administration, and the third is in real estate planning and development. And so uh, all three of those areas have been very good in earning a living uh, in the uh, 30 years since I've graduated from college and have served me very well. Well, very good. We're delighted that you could join us. I should say just that uh, this is many years ago, but I used to I used to bump into softball teams from Holding Fort. I assume mm -hmm. they still play softball in that neighborhood. And baseball. See there? Well, of course, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, the home of... Uh, the old St. Cloud Rocks, if I recall correctly, right? Uh, the holding port is not the home of the St. Cloud right. Rocks, but St. Cloud, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of the best amateur baseball in Minnesota played in the uh, 40s and 50s in, the, in those communities. Which is kind of interesting because the team that used to be the Rocks, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, there was another minor league or a uh, amateur <coughs> baseball team that was brought forward, and they just last year changed their name back to the Rocks. So we've kind of come full circle. Hey, there you oh, go. Good. We're back to the beginning. <laughs> All right, well, we'll leave um, amateur baseball and go to subjects that are perhaps of a little more current interest to uh, our viewers, given that the legislature is in session. And Representative Khan, we were discussing before the program some of your work with the Legacy Fund. And so let's talk a little bit about that issue. We've had a number of questions from viewers about that. They're kind of all over the lot. Some think, uh, uh, some think that we should change direction. Others are happy with the way things are going. Tell our viewers a little bit about what's going on with the Legacy well, Fund. First of all, I'm chairing the Legacy Committee, and it's certainly a very exciting place to be. We have a wonderful committee, I think, on both sides of the aisle. They look very concerned, very interested in working on it. And I'm, I don't know if we want to, a lot of the direction in which we've been going has been very satisfactory. And I'm not, I don't think we're in for any radical changes. Uh, I'm looking at a couple of things. One, I want us to take the name legacy very seriously. And I want us to really think every time we do something that we're leaving a legacy for, for the future. And I, I want us to also look at the groups that may have been somewhat disadvantaged in recent appropriations, you know, the ones that don't have big lobbying groups here. So I'm kind of looking at maybe immigrant groups, at Native American, African American groups, children, um, the elderly, possibly the disabled, and so forth, programs that do this. And the legacy, for viewers who don't know, I shouldn't say, we have, um, so we have an outdoor heritage section that deals with environment. We have a clean water section. We have a parks and trails section. And then we also have an arts and cultural heritage section. And we were definitely reminded of that today, because today the Minnesota advocates of the arts were mm -hmm. all over the state capitol, just reminding us how interested they are in making sure that we see the proper kind of funding for the arts. There are um, some of the questions we've had from viewers uh, uh, have come up with respect to the issue of trails. and. Uh, you know, urban versus rural trails and things like that. A a am I correct in, in thinking that that must be some kind of a flashpoint or there's been some concern about well, that question? There has been a little bit. The question of do you put the trails where the people are or do you put the trails where the land is? And one of the principles I hope we're going to use this session is the principle of connectiveness. You know, that there we have, we'll have different <clears throat> levels of parks all over our trails. And what I say, the perfect project I want to find fund would be a trail that connects two areas that have possibly trail systems and park systems and haven't been connected, and that it also acts as a wildlife corridor to bring breeding populations together. And maybe there's a river along it that we're going to protect the water quality in that river. And I guess 
hopefully it'll lead to a historic site and be a historic. We're going to check. We're going to tick off deal. several boxes here. So, <laughs> so, well, so uh, say that a little more simply. I like the idea of things that overlap the separate categories that we have, and I also like the things that will help it. Again, thinking big legacy, not lots of little projects. I like the things that will bring you know, maybe connect a regional park to a DNR park and so forth. And we'll, and we'll bring people from outside the metro area into the metro area, people from in the metro area to outside. And I was responsible, because I chaired the committee that set that one up, for doing the Root River Trail in Lanesboro. And people just look at the effect that that has had on the, I, I mean, we don't like to say that legacy projects are just to expand the economy. But one of the things we've discovered is that recreation and trails and parks are big, can be very big economy expanders. Representative O'Driscoll, your thoughts on the legacy funding and legacy funding issues? You must have constituents who are concerned about some of these questions. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that's important to remember about, about legacy for folks, just to kind of remind them, that was the constitutional amendment question that was on back in 2008 where we asked would we uh, be willing to dedicate three-eighths of a cent uh, sales tax in order to be able to accomplish that uh, that, that goal. And the taxpayers and the, and the voters in Minnesota said yes, they would do that. And um, my little comment before about city mouse and country mouse probably uh, equates very well here. Um, there is going to be some rub as, as to what Representative Khan is talking about. It will be how many dollars would stay in the seven county metro area versus the amount of money that would go to the other 80 counties here in the state of Minnesota. And that is always a um, hot button point, not, not necessarily the scope of the project specifically, but how many dollars are going to be available in the other 80 counties versus the seven county metro. And of course, there's ways that you could make a case for, well, the majority of the population is in the state of Minnesota is in the seven county mm -hmm. metro, so the majority of the dollars should stay in the seven county metro. But if you talk to uh, my counterparts and myself in greater Minnesota, we will tell you that 80% of the land <laughs> is in the greater parts of the, sta the state of Minnesota. And many of those are in the types of properties or the kinds of conditions that Representative Khan would like to preserve. So we hope that she and her committee will look favorably upon the requests that are brought forward by greater Minnesota legislators for preservation there as well. I, I, I really think we expect to. And what we think is we want is well planned out projects. Like one of the things that I immediately rubbed me the wrong way was this kind of proposal for the what we call the Greater Minnesota Regional Trails Plan was that there was an appropriation of 100000 a year that was to go for six years, 100000 each year for six years to figure out what they're going to do. And so I immediately said, can't we put some of that money up front and figure out what we're going to do before we do it? And there's the interest. It's not too far from you because it's mm -hmm. a, say, the question of what a region. We, we have strong criteria for regional parks in the metro area that was set oh, since almost since my first years in the legislature. And we'd like to see those kind of criteria set for regional parks in the rest of the state. And one of my, the one I keep saying is a perfect example of a place where we probably, is pretty close to you, is the Quarry Park mm -hmm. near St. Cloud. Mm -hmm. That's clearly, it's not a state park. It's really too big and too important to be a city park. And that's a perfect example, and we need to, to get things that meet the same kind of criteria as Quarry Park. And really, I, I don't even know if they have a request this year, but you know, you know, and I just say that because it's a place I've been to and I know how important it is to the area. And that's the kind of thing that could be a recreational draw, very much like the Root River mm -hmm. is in, um, down in the south. Lanesboro and so forth, yes. Yeah. And, and to that end, um, there would be two new representatives that came to the legislature that would be representing the area that Representative Khan's talking about, Representative Dorholt and Representative Tice, who um, had won in a special election when Representative Gutwalt had, uh, had resigned his position. And the, the Quarry Park is a very good example of what Representative Khan is speaking about. And one of the things that is not real well known by a lot of people in Minnesota is that the Stearns County, Sherburne County, and Benton County area, there are no state parks in those three counties. And so we would be open to the preservation of the things that Representative Khan is talking about. 
As a matter of fact, in my district in Sartell, um, we, the Mississippi River runs through, and we also have the Sauk River that comes from the western part of the state. They merge together right at the corner of my district, and there is a movement afoot to preserve some, some of the uh, waterways that are down there in some of the lands because it's rapidly urbanizing with shopping centers and apartment right. buildings and things in that area. And so those would be some of the projects that um, the locals have gotten together and said we will see that as a priority. And that's one of the things we've always done in our central Minnesota area is acted as a block of legislators on what's an important priority for the cities and school districts in our area. Well, you know, I think we're going to be exactly in agreement on mm -hmm. this. And uh, uh, that exact, you're giving exactly the argument that we used when we set up the Metropolitan Regional Parks system. We had a big area with a concentration of people, some very, very good resources, mm -hmm. and we didn't have you know, there are three state parks in the metropolitan area. So I think, I don't know what proposals are coming out of those areas, but they sound like it's exactly the kind of thing I'm trying to support, maybe at the expense of some smaller, less significant things in other parts of the state. Well, Chair Khan, look favorably upon us, if you would. Uh, I already have. I brought it up before you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, a, we have a viewer from Alexandria who wants to talk about... Uh, um, the viewers concerned about the uh, Viking Stadium pull tabs are going to come oh. up short and wants to know what we're what the legislature is going to do about that. And this viewer says the governor should make up the difference. Well, I don't know that we're <laughs> going to go there, but uh, Representative Khan, you've been with the program almost, uh, maybe not quite as long, but almost as long as I have. Stadiums and stadia, as I used to say, uh, are always the subject of discussion. I think we're done with the stadia piece, but we are still have the pull tab question. What do you think about well, that? I voted against the stadium bill, and I'm the major shocked. reason. <laughs> well, the major reason I voted against it was not because I'm opposed to stadium. No, because, but you've been pretty consistent because, on this. Well, not really. I voted for the Metro Dome. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, and Twins, I don't remember. Okay, but the uh, um, I love the Twin Stadium, so I'll put that that in place. But the uh, uh, I I really did not like that funding piece at all. There are two funding, and uh, I'm not a real fan of gambling. I consider gambling to be pretty much a regressive tax on stupidity. And I also, from what I knew about it, because I've chaired the committees that have had gambling in them for quite a while, and so one of the things that I did know about it was that I didn't, the electronic pull tabs were designed to bring the young people into the bars to to do them because they like electronic things. Well, I don't really think they like doing electronic things in bars particularly. And as I understand the pull tab culture, it doesn't really switch to electronics very well. They really like kind of buying a set of pull tabs and passing them around and pulling them off and looking at each other's. And it doesn't fit with just having your own iPad. So I, don't, I, I have a couple of better gambling things that I would like to push, and one of them has been the, I don't know if we talked about this before, but the idea of having lottery slot machines at the airport. As a matter of fact, I was just going to mention it, because I know you've, you've mentioned it here uh, uh, within okay. the last couple of years. So, I should uh, have other things. Yeah. Well, the, the thing about doing things that are hard to do is that you get to talk about them forever without doing them. <laughs> but I specifically lie, and, and you know, I looked, actually someone from the governor's office was talking to me about it. And if you look at the amount of money it raises, it fills exactly the hole that they need. So maybe we'll have some interest maybe, in it. Maybe, yeah, maybe your day will come on this right. question. You never right. know. Right. Right. Different, Driscoll, different Driscoll? perspective on this. Uh, I did vote for the stadium bill. <laughs> and uh, so you're, you're seeing uh, two different sides of the issue. When MMB, the Management and Budget Office here in the state of Minnesota, was looking at the implementation schedule for the electronic pull tabs, they kind of had to put a, a scale together and say, okay, we think that there'll be conversion of this amount by this, type, by this type of day. And what's happening is the conversion rate is a little bit behind schedule. The other thing that's good news, if there is such a thing on this, the cost of the stadium is coming in less than budgeted which moves us closer to center and, and being able to, to have uh, revenues and expenditures meet one another. And the other is, instead of selling bonds in April, we're selling bonds in August, which the money that is being collected from these charitable sources, right, from the charitable gaming, is not being spent to, on debt service right now, so it is actually accumulating 
without having to pay debt service. And so um, we have now got the electronic pull tabs out at the airport, which is not the slot machines that Representative Khan is looking at right now. But nonetheless, we are making headway on, on that. And it's something that um, was brought up in the forecast. But um, neither Commissioner Showalter nor others were uh, uh, ringing the alarm bell and saying that uh, we have to take corrective action because there are other two fallbacks that are in there. There's a luxury box tax, and then there's also the implementation of a, of a lotto game that could be used if, if the situation calls for it as well. So it's a noted item that we're behind schedule, but it's not something that we have to think that the sky not is Not time falling. to panic yet. I do not believe it's time to panic yet. It's just time to do the airport casino. So, well, there you, there you go. It's, we're, we're not going to miss an opportunity here. Absolutely not. Well, all right, let's move on to our next question. A viewer from Pelican Rapids wants to talk about the discussion about raising the minimum wage and wants to know where the panel stands on that. There have been kind of multiple proposals that have been floating around. The president had a proposal. I think there's been some discussion about this in the legislature. We had another viewer from somewhere else, a viewer from Pelican Rapids, not clear whether they're for it or against it, but we have at least one other viewer who had expressed concern, wondering if it uh, might not be a, a negative development. Let's start with you, uh, Representative O'Driscoll. What's your thought about this, uh, this question about raising the minimum wage, and uh, what do you think is going to happen to it? Well, a couple things. Number one, the news cycle for this day and age moves so fast. What happened this morning is yesterday's news or, or a week ago's news from, from days gone by. And what's starting to happen from what I'm hearing from, from job providers across the state of Minnesota and others who have an interest in this is that the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare, as some people refer to it, that there's a cost that's built in for business on that. There's the concern about the governor's business to business tax. There's a concern about how that's going to affect the business. And the third prong right now is the shift in minimum wage. If all three of those go into place at the same time, there is some real concern uh, in the business community as to what that's going to do. Uh, there are people in the business community who are holding off doing hiring until they can get a better idea of the cost structure for the B2B tax as well as the, uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, implications and costs, and the third being minimum wage, going to stop hiring. And depending upon what that is, that could have the reverse uh, intended consequence or an unintended consequence of layoffs or you know, people not being able to get a job. And the people that that's going to hurt the most are probably those who are teenagers or college students. Say we have a teenager by the name of Randy, and Randy wants to get a part-time job, generate a little bit of income uh, while she goes back to school. She may not have that opportunity to be able to do that because the minimum wage is just pushed out of the category of an employer being able to, uh, to bring her on or to uh, replace that position if someone leaves. Representative Khan, your thought on the minimum wage issue? Mine is exactly the opposite. I was embarrassed to find out how low minimum, Minnesota's minimum wage is and how low we are down on the level of states of states that, that do it. It's now six fifty an hour. I think the federal minimum wage which is higher than that. And um, I'm strongly in favor of, of raising it. There are a lot of studies that show that raising the minimum wage is very helpful to the economy. For one thing, the people who get their, uh, an increase in wages at that level spend every bit of it. It goes right back into the economy. And I think there have been no, you know, you know I'm, I'm not on the committees that will decide how much it is or how fast it goes, but I think we're going to do it. When I realized, you know, I didn't understand why we didn't do it in the first week we were here. To that point. Um, the minimum wage right now is 615 in the state of Minnesota for certain classes with training wages and, and uh, intrastate activities, and it's 725 at the federal level. Moving from 725 up to 1055, which is the Winkler proposal, in a three-year period of time, moving that from where we are to 1055, 40% increase or better than 40% increase in that short period of time in an economy that's fragile at best right now. That's got some, some negative impl implications. I know that when I was in college and in high school, I started out at $3.10 an hour making minimum wage. And what I learned was one of two things. Either I was a person who or my peers were not um, making it at that job. They took their skills somewhere else. Or they became more valuable to the employer. And they ended up uh, earning pay increases as a result of that. Within a five-year period of time, and I know we're talking about dated dollars here, $3.10, I was making in five years $5.60 an hour, an 80% increase in earning power 
in that five-year period of time. And the, the uh, interesting part about that was I did that through high school and into college, and I was able to graduate debt-free because of some of the other skills we talked about at the beginning. Got my real estate license at 18, and there is no minimum wage in real estate sales. It's how hard you work and how much you sell to be able to get that. And I think that really what folks are looking at is an entry point and being able to, to uh, gain some skills, gained some jobs. At 22, I had some pretty awesome responsibilities in the grocery store that I worked at. Supervising people, responsible for deposits, placing orders at age 21 and 22. I think that's a, a, a pretty good success story. Well, the jobs I had when I was in college were file clerk at whatever the minimum wage was at that time. And the one good thing about mm -hmm. having a job like that is it really convinces you to stay in college and, <laughs> <laughs> and get enough education to my, get a better job. My, my experience <laughs> was the same as yours, uh, Representative Kahn. My first job was $1.65 as the handyman at Cliff Kai's Motel, $65, $65 an hour at Cliff Kai's Motel on the north end of Mankato. And what I demonstrated was I wasn't very handy and I needed to go find something else to do. So, uh, so you're, uh, I, I, uh, I second what you just said. Um, we had a... Um, Question from a viewer about uh, higher education. This viewer from Blaine wants to know about uh, what might be happening on higher education in the, this uh, in this session. Let's start with you, Representative Khan. Have you got any well, thoughts on that? Um, I hope we're going to increase support. You know, we at the University of Minnesota, which is the main institution in my, I have um, that and also a private college, Augsburg, in my in my district, and part of St. Kate's is also there. But um, um, I'm. The amount that we've given to the university has been bel uh, actually cut, not even not kept up with inflation. So I hope we're going to look at better funding for the university. I hope we're going to look at some programs that look at the horrendous issue of student debt. I mean, I um, again, having gone to college an awfully long time ago, student debt was nothing that anyone had. Tuition and everything was low enough so that your family could do it. You could do it with, you could make all the spending money you needed in a summer job or, or something like that. And I'm just horrified when I hear the levels of debt that students are, um, are graduating with. And I think one of, the, one of the things that, and I think we're looking at various programs to do it, maybe tax rebates for students who after their education stay in Minnesota. and, um, and you know, again, I'm not on those, neither of us, I guess, are on those mm -hmm. committees, so it's hard to know exactly what's in the works, but I hope we're going to make some significant cuts in both programs that will help students and also um, better funding for higher education, because I think that's what the future of the state depends on. We don't have oil like North Dakota, but we do have brains, and we have to keep the brains here, and we have to build more of them. Representative Driscoll, your thoughts on this? Well, in uh, the central Minnesota area where I hail from, St. Cloud State University, a major Minsky institution, uh, we also have a tech college. We also have a number of private colleges, one-year and two-year schools, and a number of other technical uh, schools. So that's a huge part of not only the economy, but people come to central Minnesota to receive that education. And we've been fortunate over the years that a number of people have stayed in the central Minnesota area and been able to find employment. <coughs> and one of the things that I do recall when I was going to school that uh, I told myself, I'm going once. I want to get the skill set that I need so that I can be able to get out into work and not have to go back to school um, because I wanted to just move on and, and keep the keep the myself moving in that direction. So I was looking at my investment as a long-term investment. So if there is stu are students who have to take on debt to go to school, and again, I was pretty fortunate because I was able to, to work through college and to be able to generate that income. <coughs> but if you take and look at the fact that that's a lifetime investment for your education to earn an income, it's not unreasonable that a student would walk out with some type of debt these days for an education and amortize that, that as they would a, a home mortgage or something along that line. The amount of debt, the amount, that's always up for question, but I don't think it's unrealistic for someone to make an investment today to raise their income in the future. I like to think of it in terms of the state making and helping to make an investment to raise the future of the state, because that, that's what we need. We need an educated population to move to the next level of economic advantage. 
Bureau from Southwest Minnesota has a question about um, uh, the, and I'll just read the question. Is the legislature going to pass the Antler Point restriction, four points on one side, again in southwestern Minnesota? I know next to nothing about this topic. Do either of you know anything about this? Uh, I just know what it is, but I have no idea of what's going to happen. It has to deal with how, what kind of a buck you can shoot right, or something right. like that. So. And the buck that we're talking about is not a dollars and cents item that we would uh, normally think about <laughs> right. at, this, uh, at this juncture in our conversation. Right. It is a very controversial item. I don't um, sit on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, so I'm not familiar with it uh, as intimately as I might be with some of the other things in the committees that I'm in, but I would concur with Representative Khan. It's controversial, and there's no doubt that we will be hearing some more about that as, as we go through the session. And this is something that the legislature is likely to act on one way or the other between right. now and the end of the session? Uh, Neither I, of us yeah. know, because yeah. we're not on that committee, yeah. and we don't know. And we don't know what happens if they do act or they don't act or Perhaps whatever. we should ask our Senate guests what yeah, they Yeah, that's right. We'll ask the that. Senate guests. It's a, they, well, that question goes to the senators, and they don't seem to have a response. All right, so we'll move on. So, uh, so then we go to this question of sand frack mining. Uh, there has been some movement on this. There's been a, a bill, uh, I think a bill in both houses. Uh, let me start with you. Uh, Representative, um, uh, what what's going on on this topic, and do um, you have any thoughts on that? Well, the idea of the sand frack mining is similar to mining in any sense, even if you're up on the Iron Range where you're going down to the Earth's subsurface to take out some kind of, uh, in the case of, of uh, the Iron Range, you're going in taking minerals and, and metals out of the ground. Here you're going in and taking specific sands that are used in other uh, fabricating processes or the extracting of oil and, and the like. And I can understand where there's some questions and some concerns from folks relative to this. Um, I hate to be twice in a row saying I don't know much about it, but it's not something that my district has a lot to do with. And I know that in the, the southwest part of the state, it is a very big issue because of the type of sand and materials that are there. And um, the unintended consequences, perhaps, of erosion and different things that are with that. But I think that. Um, the two can work and coexist as an enterprise for the state of Minnesota, as well as to, uh, employing sound environmental standards and practices to uh, avoid some of the other issues that do pop up with, with, the, with the concept of mining. Representative Kahn, your well, thoughts? Well, um, I actually have studied this a little bit, and one of the problems is, is that it came up very, very quickly, and there is not a lot of expertise. The three states that are Problemat that, that have a supply of this very fine silica sand is Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois in some sense. And, it's, uh, uh, and one of the problems is the high profitability goes really to the oil extraction. It doesn't even occur to the, to the mining of the sand. We don't, we don't think we have adequate fees on mining. We don't think we adequately understand the environmental consequences of it. And the worst thing that's happened is that in the areas like in southeastern Minnesota and southwestern Wisconsin, one of the things that the companies have done is that they, they move in to a place where there isn't a lot of expertise. They hire off the county engineers. They've hired off. There was a question of the mayor of Red Wing being hired by one of these companies. And for a while, I guess he thought he could do both, and then he, with great, uh, with the great big uproar, he resigned as as mayor. But we really, uh, I, I think that what the bills are calling for is for a moratorium on the mining while we figure it out. We figure out what kind of a bond we might need to make sure that we're restoring the water resources. What's the pollution from the very fine silicate deposits? And the other, it's not just the mining itself, but it's the transport because it has to go, it's not used here, it gets used far away. And there are rail yards and truck yards and very scenic parts of the state that may have huge amounts of industrial trucking on them, uh, on ill-prepared roads. So there's a lot to think about. It came very, very quickly, and I'm hoping that we're going to have a, a moratorium on extensive action in this direction until we figure it all out. Our panel last week was talking about, apparently there are some competing bills, uh, one or two years, uh, 
Any observations about uh, how, likelihood it is, how likely it is that a bill will pass, and whether it might be a one or two year bill, or is it just too early to tell at this point? I think it's too early to tell. I certainly go for at least one year. I just don't know how much information you need. I know that people in Wisconsin are very unhappy about how fast Wisconsin has d gone in permitting uh, frac sand mining. You can't Rep find frack in the dictionary. That shows you <laughs> That's how, how, new new it is. Is. how new it is. <laughs> <laughs> Representative O'Driscoll, any further thoughts on this? Uh, again, I, Representative Kahn certainly knows more about it, and her background uh, lends itself probably better to, to that than mine does. Well, let's move on. We have a question from a viewer in St. Paul who's concerned about governor's proposal to increase taxes by $3.7 billion. The viewer's concerned this may affect jobs and economic development. Uh, she's wondering about whether these additional taxes affect the business climate and whether they're a good idea or not. Uh, let's, so let's start with you, I guess, Representative Driscoll. We went the other direction here earlier. So. I do believe, and that was one of the things I was talking about with minimum wage, is that there's really three things that are, that are happening, and they're not in separate silos. They are going to impact one another, and that's the Affordable Care Act and, and what that's going to do to employment. It's the business-to-business -business tax, and it's also going to be uh, uh, the idea, too, of the minimum wage that we were speaking about before. Specifically to the B2B or business to business tax, I'm finding out as I'm listening to constituents from my district uh, who um, will have to pay this, and they weren't even thinking about having to pay, pay that type of a tax. And some of those folks are in the constituency circle that I'm talking about are cities and counties who, in my, uh, in my situation, probably a little different than Representative Kahn's, the city of Minneapolis employs full time a legal staff. Mm -hmm. to deal with municipal issues, employees on a full-time basis, an engineering staff. They wouldn't be paying any kind of sales tax on those services. I go back to Sartell and Sock Rapids. They don't have a need to have a full-time city attorney. Right. They will end up paying sales tax when they buy those because they are not exempt as a, uh, from that standpoint. And most of those smaller communities do not have full-time city engineers. Either. And the list goes on. Right. And so what's going to happen is in the city of Minneapolis, for example, the costs that are associated with this, road improvements, they will be subject to sales tax in greater Minnesota. You don't have a city engineer, and those costs are just going to be embedded in the costs that either taxpayers have to pay or attributable to individual properties. And I think that there's a disparity there. And uh, the cities and counties still continue to pay sales tax in the state of Minnesota. As I have that conversation with a lot of people, they're very surprised. They said, really, they're not treated any differently than any other type of enterprise or business in the state of Minnesota, with the exception of police and fire or emergency vehicles. Specifically in talking to businesses, they also have that concern about what's going to happen. So starting to draw out of the company's bottom line, increase minimum wage, the B2B taxes, depending upon how you're organized, you could be a, a, a sub S corporation, or you could be a situation where you would end up being a subject to the 2% tax that the governor's mm -hmm. looking at, plus the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's creating a lot of angst for a lot of folks. Representative Kahn, your thoughts? Uh, I don't disagree very much with, um, my, with my colleague. Uh, I kept, say, kept saying that, first of all, I totally support uh, the governor's tax on higher incomes. I think we've made our income tax less progressive. It could be the most progressive tax that we have. And he ran on that and got elected on it. And actually, people are so upset about the B2B tax that we're not even hearing about that. I do support some, you know, the fact that we've become much more of a service economy. And I do support um, uh, many more tax or more uniform taxes on services than we have for, ex for, well, for example, you pay a tax if you're having your dog's hair cut, but you don't have, a, you don't pay a tax if you're having your own hair cut. And I think the things that aren't, Well, some of us know, don't have any unfair. hair to cut, so it's not, well, no, never mind. <laughs> but, and, and so I think, you know, some of them that are, I, I looked at the unfairness of the B2B tax mm. in a slightly different way, but it's with the same result. You have a very large corporation, and they'll have their internal legal staff, their internal communication staff, and so forth. You have a small independent business that's doing the same thing, and they'll have to hire outside legal mm -hmm. staff and pay for it. So I haven't, that's one that I've, you know, I'm not on the tax committee, so I don't raise too much. The mm -hmm. tax on clothing occurs in lots of places, particularly the thought of a tax on more expensive clothing. 
um, you know, I, I think we could, we could look at some of those things that have been exempt. If I could just go back long. to that for, for one more moment. One of the things that um, is a little perplexing to me is that the $3.7 billion increase that the governor was looking at is going to be used now to plug about a $625 million shortfall. And so the 0 0.7 is what's going to take care of the shortfall that we have. And we have $3 billion that would be otherwise uncommitted or that would be involved in other spending that the governor is looking at. We raised about $3 billion more in the current biennium that ends in, January, in June of this year. And the good news for us on that is that that's money that we've raised without changing the tax rates, without changing one word in the tax code on this, and we were able to generate more, more income on that. My question becomes, what are we going to do with the education shift? We've paid back most of that, and we're down to about $800 million. Minnesota's moving in the right direction right now, I believe, with keeping things where we're at. Got to go back to making sure that we don't do things in the way of regulation that's going to prevent business from wanting to hire, getting the minimum wage too far out of line, dealing with the ACA, and dealing with those issues of the business to business tax, getting those job providers to be comfortable once again that there's going to be some predictability for the, for the coming years so that they can build around their business plans. Well, I don't want to argue about the amount of new tax money that we need. I do think repaying the school shift and getting our budget on a sensible, not going from crisis to crisis direction is fine, having the proper amount of budget reserves and cash flow account. And uh, also, the things that we haven't adequately met, personal care attendants. I had some personal care attendants in my office telling me about the problems, you know, that they've had in retaining people in facilities and so forth, and the hard work that they do for very little money. And I think not a uh, uh, and the thought that we've kind of cut out relatives who are taking care of people from being paid as much as they used to be paid for that. And again, that's a very cost-effective way of delivering care to people in their own homes. So I think there are, you know, I'm not going to argue that there are $3 billion worth of holes to pay. I've also talked about more help needed for higher education. You know, not only at the University of Minnesota, but other places. So, you, a viewer from Duluth wants to talk about tax, uh, pro property tax reform, particularly for senior citizens. This viewer is concerned that that maybe uh, the legislature should consider some relief for senior citizens, uh, and um, suggests a fairly substantial amount, looking uh, in the direction of 30 to 40 percent. But let's talk about property tax reform and where that might go. Um, Representative Kahn, your thoughts? Well, on the that? problem the problem is is that as the state cut back on local government aid and school aid and so forth, the place that cities like Duluth and like Minneapolis went uh, to recoup some of that was to the property taxpayers. And so, again, I think you, mm -hmm. you, you ended up not having tax experts here. So. Right, right. But <laughs> so we, we not, ask the so questions <laughs> that the viewers have, and we do the best we can with what we have, know. you know? But the, uh, the answer is I'd like to see local government aid increased. I'm not sure the governor's prop in his budget has a property tax refund, but it's kind of this $500 a person, which is obviously at the higher end is going, is almost nothing going to people who probably don't need it, and at the lower end may not be getting mm -hmm. enough to people who really need it. So I don't know what kind of tax reform we need to do, but we do need some help, and local government aid is where I'd like to see it go. Yeah, a couple things on that. I do represent communities that get local government aid, and that is one thing that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, binds Greater Minnesota to St. Paul and Minneapolis. So there's all these different coalitions, if you will. Yeah. Greater <laughs> Minnesota for transportation, yeah. legacy, some of those kinds yeah. of things against the, the, the seven-county metro. This is one thing that tends to bind uh, Greater Minnesota and the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul together. To that point, uh, we have been accused, and I say we as Republicans, for doing some shifts and causing property tax taxes to go up. But in the governor's plan right now with those B2B taxes, if that goes as planned, the dollars that we're taxing for the state of Minnesota and generating that is taxing local sales to our local property tax dollars. And so in essence, what's happening is we're taking more money out of the local city budget, giving it to St. Paul, who may or may not give it back. And if we don't have as many hands touching that money, 
there aren't as many costs associated with that. So um, the local government aid in the governor's budget, it does go up till 2018, then it drops right back off again, and those cities are going to still be left with those, those taxes. So there's a structural issue with that. Specifically to the $500 rebate, it's very, very fluid because this year it's five hundred dollars, next year it's four seventy five, and then it's three fifty, and then it's a dollar fifty, and then it's well, you know, we need to do something different here. There's no permanency in the mechanism on that. All right, a couple of specific questions we get from viewers. Uh, our viewers pay attention to lots of issues, uh, and, uh, and let me point out before yeah. we leave that totally. Yeah, sure is that we're going to look with the new forecast. One of the problems is, is that the governor's budget and what the legislature has been working on was based on a November forecast. We now have a February forecast that was a little bit more optimistic. And so next week, I, I don't know if it's by the time you're doing your next show, yeah, right. I think we're going to be seeing a different governor's budget. So you may have different questions. Yes, it's a moving target. About. There's no doubt about it. Um, a viewer from McLeod County wants to know, and I'm going to just ask you, Representative mm -hmm. O'Driscoll, about this, wants to know what the future is of the Sartell paper mill after last year's oh. fire. Is that, oh. Does that involve legislative issues at all? That's a very good question. And I thank the viewers and, first of all, thank the support uh, for Sartell during that horrible disaster that occurred on Memorial Day uh, this past year. We have uh, had just about, uh, I won't say every firefighting uh, unit from across the state of Minnesota, but we were supported by a number of people for a long period of time on rotating shifts to, to work with that. And we did have one fatality that was associated with that and a few injuries. And to the question, what's going to happen? Versal Paper has closed that facility down and has announced that they're not going to be reopening that as an ongoing concern. A uh, new purchaser has come in, and if they haven't closed, they will close on the purchase of that. And what they're going to be doing is taking down the steel structure on that, and they're going to be recycling and uh, repurposing the steel in that. And when they get it back down to uh, bare land again, there's going to be then a, uh, the, either they will or they will sell to someone who will then really basically redevelop that property along the Mississippi River. And my hope, if I have any say at all in this as a lifetime resident of the community, the core building that's over 107 years old mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. got some very, speaking of legacy, there is some really nice character to that and it would be a very nice facility mm -hmm. to be able to, to um, have some type of a market. and. Uh, when I say market, shops, stores, mm -hmm. those kinds of things along the banks of the Mississippi River. And um, as you come south to the, to the paper mill, there's a beautiful place for a marina where they used to bring logs in <laughs> in the old days when they, before they started bringing them in by truck, trailer, and crane, and that, they, that would be a very, very nice facility. And I had the opportunity to walk that property with folks from Deed this summer uh, and uh, brought back a number of memories. But um, Sartell is resilient. We feel the pain and loss of, of a member of the family. That mill is one year older than the city itself. So we literally grew up together, and it's, we feel the loss of a family member, if you will, because of how good that facility has been in providing jobs to the community and the history that we have together. All right. Um, a viewer from Wilmer wants to know, and I'm going to start with you, Representative Kahn, uh, because this is a perennial. You've dealt with this uh, for many, many years. A viewer from Wilmer wants to know, Will the state let schools start the school year before Labor Day? <laughs> what do you think? Well, this is one where I take the kind of non-intellectual answer. I like I went to school always starting after Labor Day. I really don't think summer ends until Labor Day. <laughs> and I even though I know all of the arguments in favor of education and letting school districts do what they want, I always vote to Keep You're a post-Labor Day vote. Yes, I'm a post-Labor Day vote. And I think, and, and it is, a, you know, it interferes with so many wonderful things in life, like students' jobs and the state fair and all sorts of it, other it things. It is an interesting issue because it has very little to do with the normal partisan labels and has a lot to do with uh, sort of local interests and some philosophical yeah. arguments as well. So. Uh, so what do you think, Representative O'Driscoll? Uh, I have, unlike Representative Khan, <laughs> always started school before Labor Day <laughs> and have always enjoyed that. Uh -huh. I know uh, from, a, from a selfish standpoint, I appreciated at the end of when summer came, you didn't want to see it end, but you're ready to go back to school. But I can sure tell you that in May, when the weather's getting nice and the days are getting longer, I could hardly wait to get out of school. <laughs> and so that's what's pushed us into to the oh. June time frame. And I understand where the resort owners are at and, and the State Fair and others on that. Um, 
if we if we get back to where we are right now in state law on this, um, you have it's it's very Swiss cheese. About uh, about a third of the schools are starting af, uh, before Labor Day because there's this little pesky thing in the state statute that says if you're doing a building project and that would interfere with your ability to do that, you can start school earlier. Well, <laughs> if you are the St. Paul school system, you are the Minneapolis school You're system, old. you are the Anoka Hennepin, which There's are always the largest the districts in the, in the state of Minnesota, you will always be doing somewhere in oh. your facilities a project, so you can drive a semi right through that. And I think we need to treat all of our kids the same by giving them the flexibility at the local level to make those decisions. And I know that I'm unpopular with my friends in northern Minnesota <laughs> and in the tourism <laughs> business, but, um, and as I explained to them before, or the same thing. I said, we're going to agree on some things. That one I just have a philosophical difference on. And if we had an ability to close that loophole, I would help close it. Well, so. see, there you go. There could be legislative action in any number of directions. Any, any guesses on how this question is going to uh, turn No, out? again, you hit a committee that neither of us are on. So. Okay. Well, well, it's I all, think you can, I, it I gets, think we know how we'll both get, vote on It on always the, gets it, to the floor, though. We <laughs> always have a vote on the floor. And I think floor. we know uh, at least how two of the 134 are going to be voted. <laughs> well, there we go. Tonight, so so. We just, we'll just we'll keep a running tally as we go through the program for the rest of the rest of the uh, winter and uh, spring here. Here's an interesting philosophical question from Emily in St. Paul. Uh, she notes the rise of polls. There are lots more polls on lots of issues constantly asking uh, the public how they view a particular issue. And she's wondering what influence that has on legislators in terms of how you approach a particular issue and, and whether you vote for or against it. And uh, Representative Khan, veteran well, legislator, what do you think? My experience is that you always like the polls that agree with you and you dislike <laughs> the ones that don't, and you use the ones that agree with you, and you find things wrong with the ones that don't. Bad so. sample. Bad sample. <laughs> Didn't ask the yeah. wrong question. Right. Ask the wrong people. Right. Margin of so, error. Right. So I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think, first of all, it's, I think legislators are much more affected by contact with their constituents than by polls. And that varies, of course, from district to district. So that's what I always tell people, you know, or people who will call me on an issue that are not my constituents. If I agree with them, I'll say, first thing you need to do is call your own legislator. And I think, you know, we have, our districts are small enough and we have good enough contact so we can have a better idea of what our district is thinking <coughs> than what statewide polls are telling us. Representative Driscoll? We didn't start, uh, oh I should watch how I phrase this, legislating by poll or managing yeah. government by polls until we started seeing it more at the national level. And some people were accused of, uh, and President Clinton was accused oftentimes of legislating and leading by, by polls on those kinds of things. I think that people like to know what people are thinking, and there are companies that when you see media-driven polls, it's part of, part of it is we want to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. We want to be having people pick up our papers, tune into our newscasts and things, and so they provide those as a service uh, to try to help uh, them to, to stay relevant in the, in the front. I would agree wholeheartedly with Representative Khan when she says the best polls are the people that you, that you represent. There are obviously lobbyists and different association groups that come in. I listen to what they have to say, but I listen much more closely to what the constituents have to say. And there's one poll that I have found that is never, ever wrong, and it's called Election Day. It, it, uh, it is outcome-based outcome education, <laughs> yes. isn't it? A viewer from Bemidji wants to talk about what is driving up the cost of higher education at the state level. We talked a little bit about the fact that it's been going up and, and student loans and some of that, but. What about the causes for that? Um, let's start with you, Representative Driscoll. That's a very good question. I think that it's the reason that it's costing more at the grocery store. They're, the inputs are just costing more to heat the buildings, to fuel the vehicles that, that service, uh, the, to provide the inputs for the textbooks and the other kinds of things. It's just going up, and the cost is just going up. And you also have facilities that at one time were new and you didn't have as much maintenance on those, you now have to go back and, and work on those. And one of the things that's kind of nice, in my opinion, when you walk on to, to the college and university campuses in Minnesota, is that the buildings have been preserved. And so you want to keep that, that type of legacy or heritage on there. And there are costs to doing those kinds of things as well. As we have more um, specialization, and fewer people who are going to be able to teach or to educate in those areas, there's going to be some market-based compensation issues that you're going to have to look at on that as well. Representative Kahn, your thoughts on what's driving the higher cost of education? Well, I, 
I think one of we we have to look at things we can do to possibly lower the cost. And one of the things that has been brought up at the University of Minnesota is expanding administration. And and are there many more administrators who are being paid an awful lot more money? I I know the athletic budget is totally separate, but uh, and so it doesn't get into the general fund. But when the university, even if it's just football money, pays eight hundred thousand dollars not to play a particular football team because they think they might lose that doesn't fit into any kind of economic wisdom that i have so your, your colleague representative Pulowski has uh has made sort of a uh, i mean i think he's put down a marker on the question of administrative expenses and i think he's particularly concerned about minsky uh, we haven't had him on the program yeah. yet this year but we have had him on past years and i know he's talked about this your thoughts on that particular aspect of this? I think it's well worth looking at. I think mm. that that's uh, um, that definitely. I think we've done much more compartmentalizing uh, uh, administrative duties at various places. For Minsky, I'm not with all the huge number of campuses that we have. I don't know that we couldn't have more cooperative administration between those campuses, particularly the ones that are a little bit closer together. So Admin, administrative expenses, Representative Odrisco, any oh, thoughts on that? Yeah, they're, they're clearly, you, you, if you look at uh, the scrutiny that the University of Minnesota is undergoing, and Representative Khan is spot on when yeah. she says you're paying $800,000 to not pay to play. Uh, where the interesting part is. You better win that, that game, is, whatever they replace they it did, with next year. I think they did. <laughs> but, but, but to that point, you know, and again, it, uh, I'm bringing issues to the table. I'm not saying I agree with the logic right. on this, but they were told. By, by the regions and by others, we want to be more competitive, we want to be able to, to market Minnesota yeah. to do this. So that was a business decision that was made <laughs> to try to fulfill the wishes of, of the, the regions and others to advance the university more nationally than, than we had been in the past. And the way to do that is to get into a bowl game. So um, the end of the session, May 22nd, yeah, 20, May 25th? 20th. We Thank only you. have a few seconds left. Get out on time, do you think? Yes. Get out on time. Well, if we don't start seeing some budget bills and start get some things moving, we may be into overtime. All right. Well, we'll see how that turns out. I want to thank our panel. We're short a couple of members, but it's been a great program, and the two of you did a great of job. Course, with that. Yeah, exactly. We didn't need to set it. We had the house here. You put it on your backs and you carried it for us, and we really appreciate it. I want to thank you, the viewers, for joining us. I want to remind you that we're going to be here each week until whenever the legislature goes home, May 25 or later. I invite you to join us each week with your questions. Until next week. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching your legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.